Today I'm going to be discussing five types of childhood trauma and how they can affect you in your adult life. By now you may have watched my first two episodes illustrating the childhood trauma that I experienced in my early childhood and early adulthood. Don't worry guys, there's time at the end of this video to go back and watch those two episodes. However, a lot of the experiences that I faced created that low self-esteem, low self-worth. What I did was use those negative experiences to maneuver through different parts of my life. What do I mean by that? What I mean by that is many people are unaware that their behaviors in their adulthood has actually been created from their childhood, therefore making them believe that it's just the way life is, this is just how I am. So for example, I mentioned in one of the episodes that an experience that I had with one of my teachers led me to have low self-esteem, low confidence, and I carried this on to my early adulthood when I started working. So I deemed people of authority in the same manner, hence my bosses, and my bosses weren't very nice anyway, but I felt that same fear after working on myself, what I I did realize is that I did suffer from childhood trauma. Once I was able to recognize that, I was able to change the narrative and overcome my fear, and which I'm hoping I can help some of you today. The first childhood trauma that I'm gonna be speaking about is abuse. Now you get abuse in many forms, but the ones I'm gonna be touching on today are mental abuse, emotional abuse, and physical abuse. Mental abuse consists of accusation and blame, control, codependence, humiliation, and more. When it comes to emotional abuse, you still have the control element that you do in the mental abuse. However, the abuser aims to control, manipulate, and make the victim, in this case a child, question their self-esteem, self-worth, and even in some cases, their own sanity. Some of you may be familiar with the colloquial term gaslighting. So basically, emotional abuse is gaslighting. And thirdly, when it comes to physical abuse, it can be in the form of smacking a child through disciplinary reasons to worse. But what this tells the child is that it's okay to be punished physically. And it's it's coming from a person that they love so a caregiver a parent and then they tend to fall in those type of relationships as they get older not all the time guys this is not obviously one size fits all but it can lead to this number two being neglect now if a child is neglected the terminology means that their basic needs are neglected so food water shelter and they can be emotionally neglected where they're ignored for any of their achievements or they're just not praised in any way and again that can cause distress it can cause depression can cause resentment resentment can cause anger, frustration, all of those things that they then may carry on with them until their adulthood. One of the typical signs of neglect from childhood that then spills over into adulthood is attention seeking. I'm not saying this is the ultimate reason, however, it is a part of it. Somebody wants to be noticed as an adult, feel that they have a presence. Sometimes people go above and beyond to try and fit in, or they can then in turn treat another person that way. They can make that person feel neglected because as I've mentioned in my last video, hurt people hurt people. So number three is risk of or actual serious injury. As a child going through a traumatic physical experience, maybe broken their leg, or they've been bitten by an animal. This can traumatize a child, even traumatize an adult, and it stays with them in their core memory and it follows through onto adulthood. Now I'm gonna tell you a little story about me. I was at risk of serious injury, let's put it that way. So I was in Jamaica and I was five years old. And in Jamaica, we stayed with this family and they had five dogs. Now in Jamaica at the time, I don't know about now, the dogs had to stay in the yard. I suppose like guard dogs, but we called them yard dogs because they stayed in the yard. So they weren't allowed on the veranda, they weren't allowed inside the house. You didn't buy dog food or what have you, they just got the scraps, you know. They were fed, but they, they weren't store bought food fed. So when they were hungry, they were hungry. So whilst we were staying at this relative's house, I went to go and play with her dogs and they were so lovely. They were quite big dogs. I can't remember if they were Labradors, I don't know what they were, I was five. They were lovely until this point. One afternoon I say, I was bored inside the house, there wasn't a TV, and I was sitting on the veranda and I thought, you know, we've got some pets over there, I'm sure they wanna play with a lovely little five-year-old. I was walking up to them, and as I got closer, I noticed they weren't wagging their tails like they were before when they were happy to see me. I noticed they started showing their teeth, they started growling. The next thing I knew, they all stood up, and they started chasing me. I was running like crazy. Remember, I'm five at this time. As I got onto the veranda, my foot that was hanging off the veranda, just before I jumped in the veranda, the dog pulled off my flip-flop. I was petrified. <laughs> so as you can imagine, for a five-year-old, it's gonna traumatize you. So that was my traumatic experience, risk of serious injury. To this day, I am not a dog lover. There are times where I have been in parks with my children and sat down and had a picnic and dogs have come over to us, trampled our whole picnic setting and sniffing my children and I just freeze. My instincts come and I just kind of shoo them away. So that's number three. 
So number four I'm going to say is bullying. Some people make a choice not to become the bullies because they don't like the way it feels, obviously, so therefore they break the cycle. However, there are some that may feel that because they were bullied, they're gonna then bully others. And this can spill again over into your adulthood. Again, this is not a generalization. Some people tend to go for jobs that they have an authority position, i.e. a police, a teacher, or a manager. I don't know, you put another one in the comments. <laughs> if you remember the word projection, it's to do with the bully, how they feel about themselves. And they're trying to project that feeling of low self-worth, lack of self-esteem. And the last one I'm gonna talk about today, guys, number five is separation from parents. This is kind of a tricky one because some parents actually have to separate from their children so they can provide a better life for that child. I do know it was common for some of my family members to be left back in Jamaica at the time whilst they were children, away from their parents, and their parents would come over to England to create a better life for their children, and the children could be left in Jamaica for years. He's created a separation anxiety, feelings of neglect. Maybe they felt that their bond with their parents were no longer. As an adult, you can see why that was done in the sense that they've left their child there so they can create a better life, get steady on their feet, put themselves in a better situation. However, a young child isn't necessarily going to understand that and they just want their parents. And unfortunately, later on in their adulthood, it may hinder them from creating relationships because they try and keep people at arm's length. So guys, those are my five tips. However, do not go yet. I have not finished. I'm going to tell you what I did to overcome my childhood trauma. It's not to say that I have magically made it disappear. However, these are things that I've worked on because I don't want to feel that way and I, I didn't want to feel that way. It's now got me to a point where I can actually share this with you. Ask me last year if I could have done these videos. No, no. And I'm just going to tell you now my tips. So these are the tips that I've used to face my childhood trauma. So the first one is praying. Got to put a prayer out there, you know what I'm saying? The next one is writing. The next one is speaking about them. And last but not least, this may be the hardest for some, is facing them head on. Now to face them head on, you've got to have acceptance of the situation. I'll get onto that in a minute. So let me start by praying. Whether I'm having a good day, bad day, quiet day, I pray. I wake up and I pray just to be thankful, to be thankful that I've woken up, to be thankful from the lessons that I've learned previously, the situations that I've come out of that I didn't think I could come out of, to pray for perspective and understanding. And yes, guys, my prayers answered. Not necessarily on my time though, because sometimes I'm very impatient. <laughs> okay, so that's number one. Number two, as I mentioned, writing. Writing something down just to get it out. Could be a story you're writing down just to get out your head. You can be so frustrated, you just wanna write it down. Well, this is called free writing. It's free of judgment. It's free of having to condemn yourself for making any errors in your writing. Once you've written it down and you actually have something physical to look at, it then helps you rearrange your thought process. Okay, so that's number two. So number three is speaking. Now for me personally, I'm able to speak to you guys because it's something I enjoy. Speaking to a therapist, they're just gonna give you the tools to work through that solution. However, they can only help you as much as you allow them to help. So if you're not willing to be open about it, it may not necessarily be the thing for you to speak to someone. However, there is an alternative called CBT, which stands for Cognitive Behavioural Therapy. Um, I've done CBT in the past. The one that i done, I don't know if they're all the same, but what i done was mini courses. So I was given a program. I explained my situation of how I was feeling. They gave me a program which had different courses. So you know the whole saying of making a mountain out of a molehill? You kind of flatten it. And this brings me on to the last one, facing my fears. I'm still a bit like this as well, guys. I don't necessarily like ringing companies. I don't know what it is about being on the phone. It just gives me anxiety. I'd rather text someone. So when I do have to ring a company, brace myself and I'll do it. <laughs> Now what I do by facing my fears is if I've got an important phone call to make, I'll make sure I do it at the beginning of the day. So at least I know it's out of the way and I'm not procrastinating and leaving it to the next day. I don't like that feeling where I'm going to bed and I know I've got something to do that's highly important the next day and it's just hanging over my head. Anyway guys, don't leave yet. Click on these two videos at the end and you can see part one and part two of my childhood traumas and my story. If you've already watched it, guys, you know what I went through. If you haven't, guys, please click. Please have a look, but please brace yourselves, guys. It was a lot, all right? So don't forget to like and subscribe and click now.